This is the Very Not Normal podcast with me, your host, Frida Weisel. Today, we are continuing on the unorthodox Netflix show with the deeper, larger question, does it matter? Does the trope matter? And if it does, how does it matter? What does it do? So let's dive right in. There's an old Mexican proverb, to criticize a society is to serve it. There is also a new modern meme. And the meme goes like this. Someone has their fingers over another person's lips, holds it down, doesn't allow them to talk, and says, shh, let people enjoy things. I find that the general prevalent attitude now is Fine, maybe some shows are trash, maybe we watch a lot of junk, but it is harmless. Let people enjoy things, don't ruin it. There is not only a whatever about culture, a attitude that it doesn't matter and that as long as it is just entertainment, it's fine, but also I experience almost a suppression, a silencing of criticism on entertainment. There is a feeling that you're ruining the show and probably critics would because the quality of entertainment and the things we're imbibing are without a doubt extremely cliched and often terrible. They're lazy productions that are made largely to keep you watching in the sensorium. But the response with a meme, let people enjoy things, which I'll put as the cover of the episode, really captures where we are at. I find myself reading increasingly things from the 1980s when modern culture was really starting to shape up and critics were starting to assess it and analyze it because then there was still criticism. Now, what goes for criticism is terrible commentary and the public just doesn't want critics. And there are many things that I hear that are a variation of this clutching of the lips. There be whatever. There's also a kind of cynical or irony or self-deprecating dismissal. (laughs) Haha, isn't it funny? I binge watch for like 12 hours a day. There are a number of ways or almost catchphrases in which people will do the mouth clutch will silence anyone who says something bad. There's, geez, it's just a show. It's just entertainment. I mean, lighten up. The implications of this is that entertainment has no consequences. It is apart from actual life, and it is a realm you go into, you have some fun, and you come out unchanged by it. I find this to be staggering because humans aren't like that. We are changed by culture. Isn't this why we invest so much money, funding, tax dollars, prestige in the arts? It should be very important. Cultures, societies have always been grounded and grounding their value system on what amounts to entertainment, the arts, right? Music, poetry, myths, legends, What's the Bible if not a set of legends, of stories that impart morality, fear of God, whatever, it reflects the time. We similarly have all of these entertainments that create our set of values, but for some reason, we pretend it doesn't affect us. It's interesting that in the Hasidic community where everything is taken to the nth degree, I'm not defending it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's only illustrative. There, there is a concept of shmir sanaim, which means to guard the eyes. You have to guard your eyes from everything you see because it can corrupt your soul. So if maybe you were on the Williamsburg Bar Park bus and on the way you passed a Marlboro ad and there was a woman in skimpy jeans and a tank top and you saw it, you can never undo that. You are now changed by it. Now, I don't agree with the ways in which the Hasidic community say you should guard your eyes or to which degree they take it. But fundamentally, the idea that we are informed by what we watch is 
obvious. It's, it's, it's true. It's one of the things we take for granted. Yet the common sentiment now is that you can watch TV and not be affected by it. I had a very informative experience with a tourist who said, why can't Hasidim let people watch TV, watch the secular world's entertainment, and then decide if they want to live that world? In other words, let people expose themselves to all sorts of entertainment, and then they will decide how or if they want to be affected by it. Again, entertainments will affect you. You're not a machine where you can decide if you want to import the data, yes or no, click on the window. What you experience shapes you, and we are ever, ever more experiencing mass cultural diets in the collective rise of watching, seeing, scrolling, flipping, and yet we are more inclined to say, meh, it doesn't matter. It's just a little bit of harmless fun. Or sometimes they'll simply turn it around and it'll become an ad hominem attack. You're just jealous. They're all variations of, shut up, let people enjoy things. There's so much more to be said about the state of our public conversation, but I only touch the tip of the iceberg in order to emphasize, to draw out our knee-jerk impulsive responses to highlight them and to say, I see them, I recognize them, and I reject them. I believe in the importance of criticism because without it, we have no bullshit radar. We can't tell substance from non-substance and we can't even go to the table until we start to recognize that criticism is legitimate and important. So that out of the way, I want to talk specifically about the myths of the unorthodox narrative about escaping from darkness to light. Who is unorthodox about? You probably imagine that it's about Hasidim. It tells the story of someone from the Hasidic community. It uses Hasidic costumes and language. It gives you a glimpse into the Hasidic community. But this story, the trope within which it sits, the mythology in which it sits, is a very Western narrative. The Hasidim are only incidental, they are only the setting in which this trope takes place. One day the trope will take place in North Korea, another day it will take place in a made-up fantasy world, a third it will take place in a Mormon culture. Today it is the Hasidim. But the Hasidim are only the props through which the coming-of-age story is told. In fact, I find that people from the community, even though they're usually very curious and they're very in the know of what is being said about the community, they don't really get what I am talking about when I talk about the myth. I know, because I am between cultures, that there are some things I can talk about to Hasidim that outsiders won't get, and there are some things that I can talk to outsiders that Hasidim won't get. And when you talk about the coming-of-age myth, most people in the community look at you like, what are you talking about? Their approach to unorthodox is in a very simplistic way. Does it benefit us, or does it not? It's either, does it make a good impression on us, or does it not? Is it negative or is it good light? Kiddush Hashem, which means a positive impression. Rightfully so, understandably so, because I think if I hadn't left, I would also have a very hard time understanding the coming of age trope, which speaks to and makes promises about the advantages and the opportunities in the Western world. The escaping extremism story is part of the rags to riches genre, which, according to Wikipedia, refers to any situation in which a person rises from poverty to wealth, and in some cases, from absolute obscurity to heights of fame, fortune, and celebrity, sometimes instantly. This is a common archetype in literature and popular culture. For example, the writings of Horatio Alger Jr. and recently J.K. Rowling. This rags-to-riches story is not only about going from rags 
to riches, it's not only financial, it's not only about winning the lottery, but it's also about status shift, about being able to completely integrate yourself into a new world, despite previously being of lower status. We might take this for granted because we're so used to this idea from imbibing the cultural messaging of rags to riches, but actually it's quite revolutionary, the entire promise of meritocracy and of an open hierarchy. Most societies would be royalty, there would be castes, there would be limitations if you're not born into the right bloodline then you cannot simply work your way into the higher echelons of the elite. India, for instance, has a caste system. Of course, the royal families would always be intermarrying royalty, which is also how it operates in the Hasidic community, where your bloodline really determines if you are from a rabbinic family. But it also operates in the lower hierarchical rungs, so if you're an everyday person from Eastern European origin, then you are by default on a higher rung than someone from the Middle East from a Sephardic background because there is an ethnic hierarchy within the community. And no matter how much money someone from, let's say, Yemen or South America will have, they will always be labeled different. They will always stand out for it. Their colorful unique identity will not be celebrated, it will not be a quirky, charming part of themselves, but it will make them always somewhat inferior. When I talk about the Hasidic community in general, I talk about the Satmar Hasidic community. I don't want to get flack from the Chabad Hasidic community, but in the Satmar Hasidic community, which I come from, if you are to join as a comfort, you're never really welcomed into the fold. You're always an outsider, no matter how much success you might have, you're always treated with that wall. And the American promise of rags to riches promises not only that you can get over the economic hurdles, but you can also get over the social hurdles and achieve complete integration into your new world. For me personally, the promise of assimilation is the promise that I can be from an ex background and that can be an enriching part of myself. It can be something I celebrate, but that doesn't interfere with my ability to connect and to feel like a regular integrated member of society. That it doesn't mark me to the people in my new world as some kind of exotic other, but rather that they see me as just the same as every day as everyone else. It's a really, really fantastic promise, and some of it is really there. Some of it is a self-fulfilling promise. It's very interesting to me to compare the coming-of-age story that I have been pigeonholed into, the escape narrative, to the stories of the American dream of the turn of the 20th century, when so many Jews emigrated from Eastern Europe, from the Pale of Settlement, to the United States for the land of opportunity. I don't want to misrepresent it, coming to America was hellishly difficult and it was traumatic and the hope was that you would come and assimilate effectively and eventually your children would have the opportunities to completely integrate in American society, which was a promise that we can say was fulfilled. But there's a very important distinction between how the stories of the Eastern European immigrant is told and how our stories are told because the Eastern European immigrant was understood to have been taken advantage of and to have been crushed in the American system, in the factories, in the slums. They were often the victims of their lower status in America, out of which they had to rise, which they had to, with grit and determination, try to fight against, to rise up against. In fact, the Jews of the time were extremely involved in socialism, in labor organizing, for fighting for themselves in the system they were in. In fact, I'll read from an article that I'll link in the podcast. A typical Jewish worker in this period could easily belong to a Jewish labor union and or mutual aid organization like the Workmen's Circle, read the Yiddish farvers, send their child to a socialist Yiddish after-school program and summer camp, live in cooperative housing, attend lectures by Yiddish and socialist speakers, and vote for the Socialist Party. In other words, what I am stressing at is 
this age was a time when to come of age was to see problems within the new world. It wasn't to always point fingers at back home in Russia as the source of the problem, but to diagnose problems in the new world. But the escape trope of Deborah Feldman, of Tara Westover, and we have also Leia Vincent, who wrote Cut Me Loose. We have Abby Stein, who wrote Becoming Eve. We have Shulam Dean, who wrote All Who Go Do Not Return. All of these narratives point their fingers at the community that they come from, and they do not diagnose any problems in the new world. Another interesting distinction between the immigrants of Europe, of Eastern Europe of the 1900s and our so-called immigration stories is that our immigration stories are successful, not an equal playing field with the general public. We are not as if we had been born into it, but we are successful because we tell the story about our success. So if you think about, let's say, the story of the rise of David Levinsky, which is fictional, but it's a very good read of a Jew who comes from Russia to America and with maybe two Russian in his pocket, scrapes it together, and eventually, by working in the garment industry, by peddling, he becomes very, very successful. These immigrants were successful by engaging in commerce, by engaging in business, but today's coming-of-age story are successful because they expose themselves as success. Now, this raises the question, what about those who don't expose themselves as success? What about those who don't tell their stories? What about those who won't or can't say that all their problems originate only from their past? The public doesn't see them. The public doesn't know of them. Their stories are not published. Their stories are not adopted to TV shows. So then what? Then the public says, well, I've seen Deborah Feldman had no education. She was a teenage mother. And despite all of that, she is now very successful. Everyone I have seen is very successful. Therefore, the American promise of integration is doable. Now, this is a survivorship bias. In fact, I'm going to read again from a very cogent Wikipedia article on the issue. The concept of rags to riches has been criticized by social reformers, anti-capitalists, revolutionaries, essayists, and statisticians who argue that only a handful of exceptionally capable and or mainly lucky persons are actually able to travel the rags to riches road, being the great publicity given to such cases causes a natural survivorship bias illusion, which help keep the masses of the working class and the working poor in line, preventing them from agitating for an overall collective change in the direction of social equality. This encapsulates the entire problem of the genre. It creates an illusion that those you see are the whole. But I can tell you, as an exocytic woman, as someone who knows many people, that for every Deborah Feldman there are many, many people, maybe a thousand, maybe thousands, whose stories you don't hear because they're not telegenic enough, they're not well-spoken enough, their story is not dramatic enough, their family was not extremist enough, they are maybe too old, too unattractive, they sound incoherent, they maybe sound crazy, they're saying things they shouldn't be saying, they're criticizing the wrong people, they are not willing to give away the kind of personal details, they're not willing to make themselves available, they're shy, they're interested in different things, whatever it might be, their stories are selected out. And what do they face? Now, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a glimpse of the reality that those who don't tell their story, who don't sell a memoir, face. But I can only give you a little bit of a glimpse because in order for you to understand the bigger picture, you need to understand Hasidic economics. And Hasidic economics are very complicated. And I might try in the next episode to cover that so I can fill in some of the questions that would naturally arise out of this subject, but for now, 
I am going to simply summarize what you face in the new world. Let's say you leave at 25. Usually by the time someone figures out that they want to leave, they already have a number of children. If the children stay behind, then they are paying a lot in child support. If the children come with them, then they are now single parents, usually, almost always, and they're supporting children on their own in a completely new system without a network and without formal education that might give them an in in a job opportunity. Now, what kind of economic world do they meet? The world they meet has not been stagnant. It's not the same world of 50 years ago. It's a world of increased inequality, of a tremendous wealth gap, where here's Pew Research, the wealth gap between America's richest and poor families more than doubled from 1989 to 2016. Or here's Oxfam, 2,153 billionaires have more wealth than the 4.6 people who make up 60% of the planet's population. But it's not only the wealth inequality, it's that any job you wanna hold, you need advanced degrees that are becoming ever more expensive, that require you to take ever more debt and invest ever more time. Life experience, what you know has become devalued and everything is now about credentialism. Now, I don't wanna talk down to you. I don't wanna give you an introduction to Economics 101. We know all these things, but I want to orient you to the reality that those who leave face all the challenges that an ordinary person faces in a degree oversaturated world, in a highly competitive, unequal, globalized economy, but they face it without any leg in. If they're 25 and a man, they probably don't even have a high school diploma. If they're 25, they have a lot of financial responsibilities already, and they have to start from the very back of the line. All of their life experience has no way of translating into our new 2020 economy. I have a ninth grader who's in a New York City public school, and I see firsthand through him how early the competition begins. If he were to leave the Hasidic community now, it would be too late for him to start. He would be too far behind. Imagine how much more so it is if you begin when you're already a teenage parent or a very young parent. Now, I can talk for everyone, and of course, people are going to be very unhappy with me for shattering the illusion and for speaking about the taboo. You're not allowed to criticize the world we're in. But in my perspective, I would say it seems that we leave to a very brutal world. And a part of the problem is that we can't even speak to it because we are trapped in the coming of age story. For instance, Footsteps is supposed to be an organization that supports those who leave, that is a lifeline of transition. In reality, there's something of a talent agency. They look for people who are well-spoken and who can present the coming of age story in a palatable, supposedly nuanced, digestible to the liberal elite format, which means you have to know how to speak feminism, you have to know how to speak about racial issues and LGBT issues. And the exchange is the ex-Hasidic person tells the right story and stays on script. And in return, you get lavished with attention. You also get exposure and you get contacts to big magazines and newspapers, which in our economy, where so much is about screaming into the void of influencers, can translate into very concrete rewards. In other words, the stories that you see in Unorthodox are the stories of the tokens. And those of us who tell the story tell it oftentimes because we're completely naive, takes a very long time to pick up on how we are being used, that we are not just being listened to and validated, and that we are being trapped in a place where we can no longer move on from there. If you want to move on and start to talk about new issues, you'll be forced and held back in this box. And sometimes we tell the stories because we think this is the only way we have an in. Five years ago, I wrote a draft of a memoir and I thought I would publish it. And the more time that went by, the more convinced I became 
that it would be the end of my creative life because once I would tell it, no matter what I would say, people would hear only the coming of age story. In fact, now I am offloading it on Patreon to like a handful of people, some 40 people, which means it's dead in the water. No publisher will pick it up at this point. And I'm fine with that because I don't think I would ever publish it because I think that to be a token is to be objectified and is to be wronged. No matter how enviable it might look from afar, for those who have fought so hard, so hard for independence, so they can find their voice, so they can say what they think, so they can evolve, so they're not stuck in some stagnant role, it is ironic and it is cruel that we should be held hostage in this coming of age story where we have to be busy criticizing our past and praising our present. But so long as the audience willfully blinds itself to the reality of those who are pushed off the stage, and so long as we are not allowed to speak openly about what is going on, about what we face when we assimilate, we have no opportunities, so people will find in the token the only way out, and it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. As I was preparing this episode, I was racking my brain and thinking, do I know anyone from the Hasidic community, from the ultra-Orthodox community who left who might maybe illustrate an uplifting, a contrasting story to the story of the coming-of-age tale, which I am very cynical of and which I think is actually something of a prison sentence. So I was thinking who I might know who might be an exception to the rule, who might illustrate what I mean by finding your own path and doing your own thing. And I finally thought of Sarah Arenthal. Sarah is a gem. She left the Brooklyn Hasidic Williamsburg community when she was 17. Now, I am not speaking on her behalf. I have no authority to speak on her behalf. I've only watched her from the sidelines. I believe we can say she's a public figure at this point. I left the community 10 years ago and she was already out and I watched her struggle to find her footing and then slowly find her footing under her. She is now an artist in Brooklyn and there are murals by her and of her all over the world. She's been in all sorts of magazines, but what she does is extremely creative and lovely. She goes around in Brooklyn, she finds things that people leave on the curb, and I can tell you, people leave all sorts of excellent shit. <laughs> if you know how to steal from the garbage, you could design your whole house. So she finds these things and she does her art on it, which is usually a woman and the, there's a kind of signature style to it. And she'll always write some cogent, very pointed commentary on the furniture piece. And she leaves it there for the lucky finder to take it home and to adopt it. As a matter of fact, the desk that I am recording this episode on, I found outside my Flatbush apartment and it had Sarah's art on it. On the side of the desk, there's Sarah's signature woman and it also says, it's official, I gained COVID weight, which is, I felt like it was written right for me. And I lugged it up, which was the exercise, <laughs> which was much needed, and I adopted it. And I love it, and it's very special and meaningful, but I've run into her art everywhere. For instance, in Hasidic Williamsburg, I've run into her art in Crown Heights, I've run into her art in Park Slope, where my mind is so far away from the Hasidic community usually, that it's just a kind of sweet familiarity, which feels like a connection to both worlds for me. But what I see in Sarah's work that I think other people would maybe not see, but that I as an exocetic person can see is that she has fought her way into being able to comment on modern life, to exist as a modern woman without being trapped in the identity of an ex person. She's a Brooklyn-based artist. I was walking near Prospect Park, near the library, the Brooklyn Public Library, and I came upon an old TV, that 1990s big square TV, maybe even older. And on it, it was black, and on the screen, it had Sarah's art, and it said something to the effect of, turn off your TV, you'll be better off for it. 
I don't know, I can't do the catchy, I don't remember what it said exactly, but you get this, you stop and you see a TV that says turn off the TV and it gives you pause. For the general public, I'm sure this is a sweet token of, hmm, but for me, it is that, but more so, I think, well, isn't it wonderful that she's able to comment on TV and its problems instead of being trapped in this place where you're like, and then I discover TV, la-di-da, I was so happy because I find that people want me to say how excited I was when I first found TV. And when I criticize TV, which is poison, there is no doubt, then they are very disappointed in me. As an exocytic woman, I'm supposed to make them feel good about their culture. So Sarah's success is that she's able to reach into her very unique experience and with that enrich and broaden her perspective instead of limiting it. But Sarah's journey, Sarah's getting here, was years of toiling in essentially obscurity, of working with nothing, of needing to cover the costs of extremely expensive art supplies in a world that doesn't quite support artists and see a use for artists to do their own thing. Sarah's body of work is 10, 20, 100 times larger than any of the bodies of work of these highly successful token people, and yet she had to struggle for so long, and any success she earned was by the skin of her teeth. Now, again, she might have a different interpretation of this. I respect her interpretation. But as a single parent myself, I think I would not be able to pull this off. Parents with children can't pull this off. If you're not as stubborn, as extremely talented, then you can't pull it off. And then what? The options remain either between potentially winning the lottery as the token or being crushed by a system that maybe you get evicted, maybe you're couch surfing, maybe you're always begging for handouts. The rest of your life, you're not only living, trying to chase your dreams, but also you have your former community gloating as you're treading water. For me, Sarah's story is a miracle, and I think she's a very special talent, but my firm belief is that you shouldn't have to work this hard. You shouldn't have to put yourself through this in order to have just a morsel of opportunity to do the work that you want to do. If all you want to do is create that which has a lot of meaning for you, then that's, that's good. That's, that's what we need. But in our capitalistic world, where everything is money, where it's all about who can walk on the other body's best to get to success, to be someone from the Hasidic community idealistic and hoping to self-actualize is to set out on a journey where you are lied to about what you can hope for while you're also essentially ignored or dismissed from all ends if you cannot prove the token story true. Because if you challenge the token story, this is the dark side of the myth, then you are denying people's faith. The people who want to believe in the meritocracy will have to face a reckoning if they are to believe you that the system does not actually provide accessible avenues of success to those who leave. So they silence you. For instance, Footsteps, the organization in human capital, will select those who will not criticize the myth. If you criticize the myth, then they select you out. And because they have so much access, because they are essentially media gatekeepers, they are able to do that. So every time Footsteps propagates some stories, they are also silencing a hundred others. And the public, by believing these selective survivor stories, is perpetuating this injustice on these so-called immigrants to America, who at the very least should not be gaslighted about the reality of what they face. So yes, I think shows like Unorthodox are bad. I think they have consequences, and I think the audience has to open itself up to hearing it and taking it seriously. For me, there is an added element of great frustration in all of this, and that is that I have watched our society become more Orwellian and more dystopian, more conformist, more like the Hasidic community over the years. 
Now much of my body of work, if you're to go through it, you'll see I'm interested in the mechanics of extremism and I can recognize some of them, the mechanics of conformity and the mechanics of social contagion. And I have watched them as they play out in the Hasidic community and I have watched them play out in the West in a new way, but still in a very poisonous way. And even in the ex Hasidic community and even among Hasidim, there's contagion of the Western style of this conformity. As I've seen these red flags, I've tried to point them out. I've found that people simply cannot grasp what I am saying because they are so conditioned into a dichotomous narrative of leaving or not leaving, to leave or not to leave. This is the only framework in which they can hear me. So if I say, I see shades of problems in my new world, they respond with, so do you regret leaving? Which is completely not the point. I don't think that I could have lived any other way. I am way too much of a nonconformist and I way too much need to speak my mind to ever be able to be a Hasidic woman. In Carrie's Joel, in the creme la de creme, I can't say it, that's not for me. The point I'm trying to make is, here's a symptom I recognize from a previous illness and people respond by personalizing it and not hearing me. And that's been very, very deeply frustrating. And I realized that I'm gonna keep talking about it because I want to be able to express this without being silenced, without my lips being squashed, without people saying, shush, let people enjoy things. enjoyed this episode of the Very Not Normal podcast with me, Frida Weisel. If you liked it, please consider spreading the word, liking, subscribing, sharing. You can also leave me feedback by going to my anchor.fm page. There is a link in the episode description of how to get to it. I'm also including in the episode description links to other sources I'm mentioning in the podcast so you can do your further deep dives. If you would like to, you can also check out my other work at FridaWeisel.com. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.